Where is the biblical land of Ophir, where King Solomon acquired his resources to build the temple? No, it's not about gold, but the restoration of history and prophecy, which is of vital importance in these days. The following map is a very shortened recap of our Solomon's Gold series, in which we prove the Philippines is ancient Ophir and the Garden of Eden, through hundreds of scriptures with historical, geographic, scientific, and linguistic support. And if you are looking for evidence, it is overwhelming and it is found in that series of about 20 videos, not here. A difficult task indeed, but we have systematically, overwhelmingly proven all roads lead to the modern Philippines and no other land fits. Here is that story in brief. Our journey ends at the beginning of creation, the very land where the event took place. We didn't start there. We followed the evidence and this is where it leads and we'll start here in chronological order. The land of creation originally named Elda is the same land in which Adam was exiled east of the Garden of Eden. This is where Adam spent the first Sabbath in the week of creation and the evidence does lead to the Philippines. Adam and Eve were then taken into the Garden of Eden, which had been created in the first seven days just to the west of Elda, modern Philippines. But we could not possibly know where that is, right? The evidence has been right under our noses all along, and we will offer a very small taste in this brief recap. In the Book of Jubilees, which was considered canon scripture and inspired by the ancients John the Baptist and even the early church fathers, Noah divides the entire earth between his three sons, which we map out. He defines their territories turn by turn, and Shem basically received Asia all the way to the Far East. One would have to review that mapping for support. It sets Shem's eastern border just beyond the Philippine Trench, or ancient Pisan River, which we explain and the garden is defined as being in that area of Shem's territory. Later, Ham's territory is defined to the right or west of the Garden of Eden. Does this prove it? No. We do that in the series. This is a brief. Jubilees further identifies the garden as just north of all the mountains of fire. We find this to be the string of 147 volcanoes literally called Ganang Ganang Api in Indonesia, which in Javanese literally means mountains of fire to this day. It sets a perfect border not only to the south of Shem's region, but also to the east confirming the border to be the Philippine Trench on that side. Of course, we prove this much further from many angles, but we can test this scientifically as though all land animals and humans were wiped out, except those on the ark with Noah during the flood. Sea creatures were not. So, find the most diverse marine population on Earth, and you find the region of the land of creation and the Garden of Eden. And the center of the center of marine biodiversity on Earth is actually in the heart of the Philippines. The Sulu Suluisi seascape is the center of the Earth's marine biodiversity, according to conservation.org and numerous marine biologists today. Yes, even more diverse than the Great Barrier Reef. This is evidence for creation, not finding human bones. Adam and Eve sinned and they were exiled from the Garden of Eden to the land east of it, back to Elda, the land of their creation. He tilled the ground from whence he came, and Jubilees demonstrates that is a literal reference. It is then that Adam gave his wife her name, which was not actually 
Eve, that's a transliteration, but in Hebrew, Hava. He then renamed the land Havila, which varies Hava to match Eve's curse from the garden, as it means one who suffers pain that brings forth. The Bible is brilliant because it defines this land by its resources and it still holds true and identifiable to this day. There is gold and the gold of that land is good, abundant. The Philippines has been mining gold since at least 1000 BC, yet still has the second largest gold reserves in the ground of any country. It is the number one gold region in all of history, indisputably. Delium is pearl, not resin, as the Israelites ate manna of its color, and the largest pearls on earth come from the Philippines. Not only is it known as the Pearl of the Orient, but the largest to date is 75 pounds or 34 kilos and estimated at about 3,000 years old. Yes, also 1000 BC. Odd. And you can add to that the second largest third, fourth, fifth, and so on, as there is no close second to this land in Pearl. The final resource criteria is the onyx stone, not the jewel, but that used as a building material similar to marble. The strongest onyx and marble on earth, yes, stronger than that of Italy, is actually found in Romblon, Philippines, even today, and it is abundant. It doesn't just have all three resources, but the Philippines, the Pearl of the Orient, is number one in all three categories, and no other land can compare. And we also locate the Pisan River and the rivers from Eden, further proving this out, and it does surround this whole land of the Philippines. Adam's generations to Noah remained in ancient Havila until one day Noah was commanded to build an ark of gopher wood, yet we find two very credible references from the early 1800s that this word is not gopher, but instead this is ophir or ophir wood, the wood of ophir which will cover. Scholars believe this was a red sandalwood and the Philippines national tree is such and even bears a seemingly Hebrew name, which ties to the story of the Queen of Sheba, which we'll cover. We believe Noah would have built the ark on a mountain, and we find Mount Arayat to possibly have a Hebrew origin, meaning earth covered, and that would certainly be a good spot to build the ark high enough to avoid the mega tsunamis from the breaking up of the fountains of the Great Deep. After 40 days and nights, though it kept raining after that, the ark was lifted above the earth and carried upon the waters, and the Bible gives only one option for where it would come to rest. The ark landed at Flood Peak when it was 15 cubits above the tallest mountain on earth, and this is the only mountain on which it could have landed on that day, as the ark was about 15 cubits below the water level and 15 above. The only mountain on which it could have landed at those biblical measurements is Mount Everest, the tallest in the Himalayas. In time, Scripture says Noah's descendants migrated from the east into the plains of Shinar, modern Iraq. So, any mountain not east of Shinar is ruled out as an option, and any mountain shorter than Everest, which happens to be exactly due east of Shinar, is also ruled out biblically. Also, the name Mountains of Ararat, where the ark rested, means highest land, and the one standalone mountain in Turkey, which is 12,000 feet too short, fits none of the biblical descriptions whatsoever, but serves to further stretch the cover-up of history erroneously. And Noah's son Shem had our fox sad, who was given two regions, Israel, which was stolen by Ham's son Canaan, and Iran, where they lived initially from Shem's territory of Asia. 
From him came Eber, father of the Hebrews, and after the Tower of Babel, his two sons split up, departing from their land in Mesha, or Meshad, Iran, on what became known as the Silk Road later, and they migrated. Peleg's lineage, the Israelites, ended up in Israel eventually. But Genesis 10 tells us exactly where Joktan and his sons went east, not west, to Sephar, the Mount of the East. Sephar is a Hebrew name for the Tree of Life, and the Mount of the East is a holy mountain of Yahuwah God, both found in the Garden of Eden, also in the East. Oh, and among Joktan's sons was Ophir, Sheba, and Havilah. They were headed to the land of the Garden of Eden and creation, and they found it. No, they could not enter the garden, but the land above it where Adam and Eve lived and Noah built the ark. The unique thing about Ophir is he is the only Ophir mentioned in scripture, yet there are multiple Shebas and Havilas, so every time you see those two names, you must ask which one. But with Ophir, there is only one, and when those brothers are mentioned with Ophir, we know to which family they refer. Around 1000 BC, King Solomon builds a brand new port and navy on the Red Sea to go to these three specific lands, and the Bible provides the resources with which his navy returned. First was gold and silver, and we already know Ophir, Philippines, has been mining since 1000 BC, and number one in gold in history, and likely silver. Many are thrown by this, though. Ivory has been abundant in the Philippines as far back as history goes, and the bones of rhinos from very ancient times have been found as well as the presence of elephants mentioned by Pigafetta, the historian who traveled with Magellan. Whether traded with its neighbors or native, either way, ivory was abundant in the Philippines. The Hebrew word for apes in this passage is actually a reference to small monkeys, not the large apes you may think of, which would be almost impossible to handle in that age. And the smallest primates on earth are found there as the Tarshiae of Tarshish, whose name seems to be no coincidence. The Palawan peacock is also native to the Philippines, and Pigafetta mentions seeing them in the 1500s as well. Then there's Almug wood, which no one seems to know what it is, yet Solomon was returning to the land of creation where Noah built the ark, and likely that same red sandalwood he used was used in the temple for obvious reason. And again, it ties to the Queen of Sheba, which we connect. So, the Philippines is seven for seven on the resource list, not one missing. And the other lands who make such claims cannot produce all seven resources, nor do they fit the rest of this criteria, as only the Philippines does. And we said this case is overwhelming indeed. But also, when the Queen of Sheba came, she brought gold from her land. She brought precious stones, which are documented not only in Mindanao, but also even diamonds in Borneo, which has a territory called Saba, which once belonged to the Queen of Sheba. It means territory of Sheba. Philippines even before the era of the modern dispute, these gemstones were also documented in the Philippines already by Pigafetta, De Morga, and others. So regardless of how they got there, native or not, they were certainly there for Solomon's navy to trade. And finally, Sheba brought a very great store of spices. The text uses a word sometimes interpreted as frankincense, a newer French word. But no matter, as the Philippines has frankincense too, called poor man's frankincense, not because of a lesser quality, but because it's cheaper as the rabbis own and endorse their Ethiopian farms in a narrow, unbiblical, unethical way. 
The story of Ophir is chronological, offering sequential events as they unfold. He builds a new port and navy on the Red Sea. They go to Ophir and note, there are no other stops on the list of this initial journey. They fetch gold and resources, and that's where we are in the story at the end of 1 Kings chapter 9. The Bible describes this as a three-year round-trip journey to the east beyond the Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, to a multitude of islands. You do notice neither of those fits Saudi Arabia, nor Africa, nor India, and we prove that many ways. And then, in the middle of the story of Solomon's navy, after they arrive at Ophir and fetched gold, then, and only then, does the queen of Sheba from the brother of Ophir hear of Solomon's wisdom in her own land, it says. And that's Ophir. And she comes at the same exact time as Solomon's navy, offering her gifts worth millions of dollars today at the same time as Hiram, Solomon's admiral. She arrives at the Red Sea port with Hiram, but she has an issue. She now has to get her entourage and 1,300 pounds of gold, a very great store of spices as has never been seen in Israel until that day, and jewels from there to 319 kilometers or 200 miles north to Jerusalem. That requires camels, which she hires, and yes, she travels through the desert to get there. But nothing in this passage identifies her with the wrong Sheba from Cush, Ethiopia, as she is from the brother of Ophir, not Cush, nor is there any requirement for those camels to be from her land. The queen or at least her land, was likely the wealthiest on earth in those days until Solomon's wealth exceeded it, really, for a short time only. Again, the sequential order is Solomon builds a navy which goes to Ophir and fetches gold. The Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's wisdom in her own land of Ophir and came to Israel. She presses him with hard questions. She offers her gifts, valued at millions of dollars today. And then she left. And that's it. She does not have an affair with Solomon, especially not produce any child, according to the source of the story, the Bible. If you have heard this, we cover its origin. The occult Kibra Nagast in Ethiopia, which makes this claim, but that queen in that story, in their words, not ours, has the legs and hoof of a goat, and we reject that as wholly false, as it's the wrong Sheba in the wrong place. This accurate queen of Sheba is from Ophir, Philippines. Another misnomer out there is the Tarshish's west, because that's where Jonah headed, yet this view is oblivious to that era in history and the rest of the Bible. The port at Ezion Gabir on the Red Sea was broken up along with the ships there, and Jehoshaphat was unable to go to Ophir Tarshish for resources as he was trying to repeat Solomon's journey. That happened just before Jonah's time, and that is why Jonah found a ship headed to Tarshish on the Mediterranean Sea at Joppa. He was running from Yahuwah God to as far as he could. He wasn't looking for the most efficient route, but the longest. So, the ship to Tarshish had to head west, but its end journey must still be east, as it must match the other passages, which say Tarshish is a three-year round-trip journey east. And this passage does too, if one really reads it. Jonah is thrown from the ship and swallowed by the whale or large fish of some sort for three days. However, scholars seem to miss the part where he was spit up on shore and made a journey to Nineveh of another three days. What Jonah did there 
is narrowed down where he was dropped off, because one cannot get to Nineveh from the Mediterranean in any direction in those days in less than about 14 days, not three. He was obviously dropped on the Persian Gulf and took the Tigris River north for a three-day journey, which is about right. So Jonah proves the path to Tarshish, which is equated to the same region as Ophir and Sheba, is east, not west. But its history continues. David tells us exactly where the wise men or kings, yes, kings, came from. And it wasn't the occult Babylon, nor Yemen, nor Ethiopia again, according to Scripture. David's prophecy in Psalm 72 says the kings of Tarshish, the Isles, Ophir, Sheba, and Seba, territory of Sheba, would bring gifts to the Messiah after his birth. This is David's son, No, not Solomon, because this son has the ability to redeem souls. So this time, the people of Ophir make the journey to Israel, which is why it took two years to get there, as they show up when Messiah is two years of age. However, the port on the Red Sea is still broken up at this point, so they have to take the same route as Jonah around Africa, into the Mediterranean Sea, most likely. Yes, we additionally prove that the Philippines has both frankincense and myrrh, and most biblical spices for that matter. And just as the Queen of Sheba, the wise men heard from the angel who appeared in the sky in their own land. They came to worship Messiah with offerings of very great value. They offer their gifts and they leave. What does this say of those who supposedly brought the message of Jesus to the Philippines? Well, we deal with that too. But the incredibly abundant proof is that the Philippines was not speculated or guessed to be Ophir in history. It is recorded as being called such many times over. Debate is on record too, and it failed then and it fails now. In 1609, Antonio de Morga wrote that they, Ophirians, already possess in jewels and gold ingots handed down from antiquity and inherited from their ancestors. This is considerable, for he must be poor and wretched who has no gold chains, columbigas, and earrings. Does this not sound like the land of Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish, and Havila? Well, history tells us it was, and this is also illustrated in the Boxer Codex, proven with archaeology in the Surigal treasure find of recent times and on display in the Ayala Museum of Makati of these exact same jewelry pieces which were illustrated in 1595. Many writings don't just propose a theory that this land is Ophir, but say it was as fact and even the natives called it Ophir and Tarshish, and Sheba was and is Subu, a direct Hebrew variant of the word Sheba, with Saba, the disputed territory, being the property of Sheba by its definition in its Hebrew origin, because no one seems to know its origin. Well, we do. This is a list of just some of the credible witnesses to history who document this, but also the neighboring nations of India and China, even Greek history, the Malays and the Muslims all record the Philippines as the land of gold, isles or islands of gold, mountains of gold, etc. Every one knew this to be the wealthiest land on earth at one time. And this is what attracted the Jesuits to come and rape and pillage the gold and resources, which still continues today, but not for long, because Ophir is not a third world country, and it will rise. 
Messiah said, The Queen of the South shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it. And we are seeing signs of this already today. Cebu is still known as the Queen of the South today, and its name is a derivative of the Hebrew word Sheba, indeed. Isaiah says, The isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will bring Israel's sons and daughters from afar. This has not happened yet, nor...